Hey everybody! In today's video, I wanted to show you how to sculpt your very own polymer clay rose. And you can make this as a pendant or a necklace or earrings or um, incorporate it as a part of a sculpture or basically, really, whatever you want. So let's get started. <laughs> so the only really tools that you're going to need are some tissue blades for cutting your clay. Um, this is a stylus tool that has an 8 millimeter end. That's important. Um, I also have this makeup brush that I use the end of it for kind of rolling stuff out. Um, a pasta machine or acrylic roller. Let me see if I can't grab one so you can see what it looks like. Um, again, for rolling out and conditioning your clay. And then, of course, some clay. So let me decide what colors we're going to be using today. Um, here I have a light pearl blue, which is very nice. It's kind of a, a softer clay. This was Sculpey, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that stuff isn't as important, I don't think. Also, here I have some black Sculpey. And we're just going to start conditioning this stuff, warming it up with our hands. I try to get it at least a little smushy before putting it through the pasta machine. That way, if it goes to crumbles, um, it doesn't just junk up my pasta machine. <laughs> now that's about the size of the black that we're gonna be using. I'm gonna break off a chunk of the light pearl blue. And I'm gonna start rolling and sculpting that out. I really like the pearlescent clays because they give a nice um, kind of texture contrast because they're shimmery. And that really has a nice effect on our final piece. Now our black here is really, really dense. Um, it's, a, it's an older clay, that's for sure. It's been a couple of months since I've played with any of my clays, so I'm not surprised. And my favorite method for heating up an old clay is to roll it between my hands to get an uneven snake and then just fold it in half and then roll it. And then fold in half. And you can twist it down if you want. I mean, you can really... But I found this is a relatively quick way of getting the heat on the clay up as well as getting it mixed. And so now from here, I feel pretty good about that. Um, we're gonna put it through the pasta machine. I don't have my machine clamped down, so I'm stabilizing it with my hand. But since this, if I were making like canes or something, um, I would go ahead and clamp my machine down to a work surface. Um, but this is basically all I am using this for. <laughs> um, is conditioning my clay, so I'm not too worried about it. Well, correction, conditioning the clay as well as blending it, because we're going to be making a Skinner blend here, so I've got my light pearl. Now this doesn't need nearly as much conditioning. It's so soft and nice. Um, anytime that you get an air bubble in the clay, and you can't hardly tell it was there, but I just go in and just kind of mess up the clay, like poke a hole in it, get the air out. Because those air bubbles can expand and pop the clay and distort it whenever it's baking. 
so it's just good precautionary measure. So now I'm going to be rolling my clays up into um, I'm rolling my clay just into little balls. They're about the same size. And I'm going to roll them down just into little tapered ice cream cones, like this. And I do that by just taking my hand, laying it at an angle as opposed to flat and just rolling like that and it rolls one side of it down and so now I'm gonna lay it like this I'm gonna roll this part down just a little bit more yeah I just lay them like that start smushing stuff <laughs> like that and I'm going to feed this through my pasta machine so that's the start I'm probably gonna put this into a time-lapse because it takes a while um, I prefer to time-lapse stuff as opposed to cut it out entirely because I do like you know if this is your first polymer clay project I want you to have a very real idea of how long this takes me now so that's after blending it the first time I'm going to fold it over like this, make sure you don't have any air trapped here, and then I'm going to feed it in fold first. So there's the second one. This one. You can see already it's starting to blend. Now we are not trying to achieve a perfect science here. And that's after just a couple of rotations or pass throughs. It's getting much wider on one end than on the other, so to fix that, I'm just going to fold this black in on itself. that through and you can see it starts to fix it and the reason it's doing this is because the blue is so much softer than the black that it just has more spread I think uh, that's my theory <laughs> And I'm just going to keep blending it until we have a very nice, even gradient. So you can see there's not as many lines. Um, but now I want to compress it down this way and extend it so that um, you could just roll it up or start tearing off pieces and make it the rose be light blue in the center and then fade out to black. But I'd like each petal to be to contain this full spectrum. So let's see how am I going to do that? Um, <laughs> to do that, I am going to roll it up. So there, I've gotten a little roll started. Again, try to make sure that you're not catching any air bubbles, because it just, it complicates things. And now as I roll it, I'm gonna be bring, adding inward pressure to make this shorter.
And by doing this gradually, I maintain my Skinner blend. As opposed to just smushing it. Okay, so from here, I mean, that, that's brought it down some. I am going to cut off, I've got a lot of extra, ooh, that's so pretty, um, blue here. But I'm just going to trim that and set it aside. We'll be using that later, so don't throw it away yet. Never, never, never throw any clay, clay away. Um, there's always a good purpose for it. So now from here, we start kind of smushing this out with our fingers to get it flat enough to feed through the machine again and I'm gonna feed it through long ways like this one more time we still have a really nice blend going on there and it's still I mean I would really like this to be about half as wide as what it is so if we can get this down into maybe a ball like honestly like I haven't <laughs> really done this too much so you're getting to see um, an inkling into my perspective as a designer of like this is what I want to do how on earth do I get there um, And really what's making problems for me is that this blue is so much softer um, than the black. And so what we're going to try to do then is smush and pull Because now that we have that color blend and, you know, that Skinner blend going on in there, um, even as we pull everything out, so now, I mean, you can tell it, it looks like this, basically. Um, but now that we have that happening, I'm actually going to come in and take a slice. And you can see now, that's what the inside of the petal looks like. This isn't perfectly what I was going for, but this is also just an end piece. And so now the way that I do the petals is I'm actually going to take this and my round stylus and I just roll it out. Even if the petal itself is quite thick, um, having a thin edge will give the illusion of the whole petal being quite thin. And then it gives it a really interesting veining pattern on the back because of the lines in my palm. So there's a petal. And then I'm just going to slice off another piece. And I'm going to roll it out. pedal to work because my hand's kind of sticky but again no rose is totally perfect each one has such unique variation between the petals and leaves and different things like that so I don't stress it a bit why'd that light just go out so I'm going to just keep cutting petals I can make them different thicknesses to achieve different sizes. And you can kind of splay and spread and position them out with your fingers first to get that kind of teardrop shape. And then just start rolling out the edges. So there's another petal. And 
And here you can see the Skinner blend. It just it made a really interesting pattern there on the inside of the uh, cane. And there's a lot of different things that you could do, I'm sure, to uh, make your rose petals very, very interesting. Now you can also, alternatively, um, just use a makeup or paintbrush handle. And that still gets you a really nice petal effect, but you'll see the difference between the edge of this leaf, <clears throat> the edge of this petal, and the edge of this petal. This one has a straighter edge, this one has a more scalloped edge, so keep that in mind too if you're making, you know, there's differences between modern um, knockout rose bushes, like how you see in a lot of commercial and residential plantings, and the um, old style like tea roses. Um, they're going to have different petals, they're going to have different, um, the way that the head looks. Some roses look like little uh, frilly heads of cabbage, while other roses are much more open and airy. Um, so definitely uh, consider using nature as, you know, a very strong inspiration. Or just use how, however the rose looks in your mind's eye. But again, like with most things, there's not really a wrong way of doing this. Like nobody's going to be like, well, I mean, people will be like however they're going to be, but very rarely will you have someone who's an appreciator of, you know, your work or your art be like, um, that's not how flowers look. It's like flowers look like all sorts of ways. <laughs> And I'm just going to keep making some petals. Oh, didn't mean to go off camera there. And so now, um, I'm going to take a pinch of this clay that we initially had. And I'm going to roll a little round of it. And I'm going to pinch one of the ends down so that it looks like a little rose bud just like that and I'm going to take this first petal that I had done and I am going to wrap it around this center piece And now I'm actually going to take, I have this tool, I'm going to stick that up <laughs> in it, and I'm going to use the smaller end of my stylus to flare out that petal. And then I'm going to bring the next petal on, and it's going to overlap just a bit. And then it's going to wrap around. And then I'm going to use my stylus tip to flare it out some. And now I'm going to add a petal. This is why I do prefer to make the petals first. Is because then I can just focus on building my rows. And I think it can really make a big difference to take this extra effort to curl that petal back. And again, just overlapping and then wrapping it around. Just like that. And then overlapping and wrapping around. 
Now you can see too the placement here on the side. Just for reference purposes. If, if feel free to experiment with different places like putting the uh, petals on in different angles and places and densities. Um, just to see what happens. <laughs> Just like that. I'm going to use my stylus point to go ahead and pull the clay back some. And as you just continue to build outward, um, it makes it becomes more and more itself and how it's going to look as a rose. Um, now I don't want to set this down because it'll get smushed on like one side or the other. So I've got this little bead of tray, tray of beads right here and I'm just going to sit it like that. That way it's not smushing on anything and I'm going to make a couple more petals. It's a beautiful rainy day today. Now these ones I'm going to start making a little bit wider. So I'm going to manipulate the clay out into a wider direction than what I had been. But I love this kind of marbled um, effect that this is giving the rose, the rose's petals. And I love that little bit of sheen that the pearlescent uh, pale blue had given it. But used to whenever I first started making roses I'd just go through and like smush it down with my fingers and that was okay but check out the difference in edges between the finger smushed and the rolled it is in the in the long haul like by the completed piece that's very slight difference um, adds up into a huge difference I think But I'm sure that you could do some really beautifully marbled and variegated um, canes to make petals out of. I mean, because really this is such an experience of color and texture that there's, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I mean, it's even if you used um, just a solid single color and then went through with um, after baking and used a paintbrush to just slightly, you know, touch the uh, edges with color. Or you could use ground up pastels, like uh, chalk pastels, to uh, add a blush of color to the clay prior to baking. You know, there's just um, so many different things that you could do here. And that's part of what's so fun about doing these roses, is um, you can make it as unique as you are. And also, that is another thing. I just accidentally puckered it, 
you can go through and take your uh, tissue blade. And especially on the larger outer leaves, you can give it some really interesting indents. If my nails were longer, I could have done it with my fingernail too, but um, uh, I was, I don't want to say roughhousing out in the garden yesterday, but I was building some raised beds and moving around some straw bales and refill refilling feed bins and stuff and um, busted up most of my fingernails, bashed my finger pretty good, um, but there goes my career as a hand model, I guess. <laughs> So now from here, I'm just going to keep opening that out, give it some nice personality and texture. And so now you can see, I mean, this one I placed almost halfway up on the, uh, on the base. So you can keep your petals the same size, but still, um, increase the size of the flower and make them look like they're larger petals. Again, just placing it up quite a ways. <laughs> So now here you can see it's really starting to uh, look like a rose. <laughs> and then our last petal. Now some of these I'm actually going to come in as well and pucker them. It's the perfect excuse to get yourself a bouquet of flowers or a miniature rose bush or, you know, uh, go see a botanical garden. Is to go and check out some of the natural variation and tendencies of plants because nature is endlessly the most creative artist I've ever met. <laughs> So there we are. That's the basic structure of our rows here. Ah, I feel like it needs one more, like maybe two more larger petals right there off the side though. You know what I mean? Like, so, okay, so I'm gonna make a couple more <laughs> petals. <laughs> and if you want a particularly larger petal, just cut it a bit thicker because that gives you more clay to spread out and work with. I'm gonna put a few cuts. Oops, sorry, don't mean to keep going off camera. Put a few cuts in the edges. And then, oh yeah, that fleshes it out quite nicely. I'll do this one and then one more. So there's that. I'm gonna, again, add some texture and variation to our edge here. Give it a nice little Boop. A little booped tip. And I'm going to make one more petal. Ooh, this makes me so happy. <laughs> and we have enough here to do a whole nother pendant as well. Well, or whatever you decide to end up making. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now this one, I am going to show you how I would make it into a pendant to attach onto a necklace. So where is that? There 
is yes much better full flower shape give it some character because it's not the perfection of a thing that makes it beautiful you know per perfection is almost generic looking you know um it's the natural variance from one creature to another one form to another that makes it unique and beautiful and special so there we go it's not the most striking contrast of colors i've ever done but i'm pretty pleased with it Now, also, too, if you like gl glitzy, sparkly stuff, um, you could totally put a gem nestled in there. But I am going to come through with, I have a little craft blade stowed away somewhere here. There it is. And I'm just going to cut right there like that. just to give it a little bit of variation. And I have a very small tipped stylus here, but I'm gonna get in there and open that up some. So that I may actually go in um, and place a little stone or we can just close it back up but I think I am gonna stick a little gem in there okay so here I have a little four millimeter labradorite bead that has a really nice flash in it and I have a porcupine quill that fits right there in the end, and I'm trying to find the prettiest side. And so here we have right where I started opening up the uh, center of the rose. And I am just going to smush that right down in there. Just like that. And then I'm going to use my stylus tip to come around and hide it some. But by this wrapping around like that, it's going to keep it from uh, <clears throat> from falling out. So there's a nice little gem in there now. So now from here, you'll want to be very careful, but I'm just going to pull my stem out. And I'm using my thinner tissue blade and normally I would not recommend this um, but use your own discretion I'm going to gently apply pressure as I slice the back off of my rose it's quite dark sorry it's winter that's gonna happen <laughs> But that's what got cut off. And so from here, I'm going to take this. That's what the back looks like. And I'm going to bake it. Um, so I'm going to set it on a glass tile or a ceramic tile. And I'm going to bake it at 275 for about 10 or 15 minutes. So I'll be right back. So here I have taken our baked rose out of the oven. It's still cooling. And I have two 18 gauge quarter inch rings. 
that I am going to close. Now you could just use one, but this I'm actually going to be turning into a necklace that has chain coming off of either side, as opposed to a pendant that is hanging down from a length of chain. Hopefully that'll make sense here in a moment for you. Now I'm going to be using this part here, our scrap, um, to help kind of stabilize everything. So I'm just going to mix it and soften it up with my fingers some. And we're going to decide what's going to be the top. And I think I want this to be the top. So very carefully, I'm going to have it flipped over. Um, and I'm going to use some liquid polymer clay. That's right here at some bacon bond. Um, and I have some long toothpicks. Somewhere. They're there. So I'm going to take <clears throat> my long toothpick. I'm going to get some of the bacon bond. And this just kind of helps bind everything together. You know, why not take those extra couple steps of precaution to get everything joined together nicely? than to skip it and have stuff fall apart um you know not just on you but even worse fall apart on the client or customer you know <laughs> so now from there i'm going to pull off a pinch and i'm just going to shape it and lay it here on the back of our rows and I'm being very gentle to not break any of the petals on the front. This is a little bit more of a delicate necklace. Um, but this gives us something that we can then take our rings, which I'm going to find the closure on, which is right there. And I'm going to have that part be embedded in the clay. Just like that. I'm going to turn <clears throat> and have the same thing on the other side. Just like that. And now I'm actually going to tear off some more clay. Make it nice and long and flat. And layer that on top of what we just did. And I'm going to use my fingers to kind of stretch and pull and smush it down. But then after that, I'm going to come through with this round stylus tool and actually start to indent and press and get everything nice and um, where I think I'd like it to be. just like that now and the options here really are limitless so you can come through you could have attached um, like just a flat backed bale attachment with some E6000 and been done with it uh, you know you could have come through and done any variety of things but now I'll be able to attach some rings to a chain and have this hang as a necklace. So with this there on the back, um, the oven's still nice and hot. I'm going to pop it right back in there for another 15 minutes and it'll be finished. So here we have our flower and it's hardened up. You can hear it you know, um, and this is how it came out. This is how the back is. I would attach the chain to either side and then have it clasp with, you know, the uh, clasps in the back. And the product that I'm going to use to finish this is called PIM 2. It's Preserve Your Memories 2. I guess the first one didn't quite make it. Um, but it's an aerosol that actually works on polymer clay. 
if it'll zoom in on that polymer clay safe and they aren't kidding this stuff is it was like $15 for the bottle maybe um but I've been using this for I mean I don't work exclude hand the blasted to get the lid off oh there it goes okay um <laughs> sorry I've been work, uh, sculpting in polymer clay pretty regularly but I mean I don't work in it exclusively and this can has lasted me a year and a half like at least um hundreds of projects uh because I mean a little goes a long way so the way that I'm going to use it is I have a piece of paper here that I'm going to use as the backing and I'm just going to put that on there like that and then I'm going to shake it a little bit um direction check can lightly before each use lay the object to be coated flat on a clear cloth la 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 yeah okay um, basic spray can etiquette. I should be wearing an aerosol mask and doing this outside, but it's rainy and I'm lazy. So let's just, uh... <laughs> just like that. <laughs> and I'm kidding, it's not that bad. It actually has a pretty, like, fruity smell. And it's not any worse or more overpowering than any kind of aerosol that you would spray after somebody's messed up the bathroom but yeah and I just leave that to dry but you can see there's no gunking it has a really nice kind of wet look and it gave us the shine that we wanted I'm actually going to go through and do another coat kind of rotate it My can's just about empty, which is why I'm having some problems here. There it goes. But yeah, I mean, it's sloshing just a little bit around in the end. Oh, so pretty. Just like that, though. And I'm going to set it off to the side and let it dry completely. And that's the end of that. Thanks you guys for watching this video with me. I hope it was helpful for you. Um, I know that uh, roses were really intimidating to me whenever I first started sculpting polymer clay, but it was something that I really wanted to do. And I personally was not happy with my results. And so I kept trying different things and learning from other artists until I found something I was happy with. And then I thought I'd share it with y'all. So if you have any questions, ideas, comments, concerns, anything like that, um, <laughs> please just send me a message, um, and let me know how this went for you, what kind of colors you think you want to try it in, and just, just, I don't know, I, I like talking to y'all about stuff, so if you enjoy my free tutorials and would like to support in more ways than just liking, sharing, and subscribing, um, and if you would also like to participate in my monthly uh, home for the Gnomeless or Fairy House giveaway, please consider becoming a $1 or more patron on Patreon. There's going to be links down below. And this, currently at the time of filming, um, it is December, so this is December's prize, but I do a new sculpt every month, and I'll put a link somewhere around here, if I remember to. If I forget, please let me know. Be like, Vaughn, you didn't put the link again. <laughs> but um, I'll put a link to where you can see how this one was sculpted and we can talk a little bit more about Patreon and all that cool stuff. But um, yeah, thanks you guys for watching. I hope you have an awesome day and uh, happy crafting. I'll see you all around. <laughs>